There are many different uh, procedures that have been pushed by industry in the last 20 years to corner a small fraction of the market to sell. The first one that I recall was the intradiscal electrothermal therapy or the IDET procedure back about 20 years ago, pushed forward by the Menlo, the, the, uh, I, the Sal brothers, S-A-A-L brothers in Menlo Park, California. And I met with them once about 20 years ago. And what it did is it constituted a, a probe that would go percutaneously under local anesthesia into the disc and it would heat the disc up to within uh, three to four degrees of of, of, of boiling, which is 100 centigrade, and would denature the protein allegedly and fix the problem. And after that, they would be put into a brace for a period of three months to allow it to heal, and that would eliminate the pain coming from the disc. The problem with that is it's a sociological problem. First off, I asked the Saul brothers, who are both physical therapists, how it worked, and they didn't know. They actually told me directly they were not aware of how it worked. Uh, number one. Number two, the procedure for this was equivalent, the indications for this were equivalent to a back fusion with a de painful degenerative disc diagnosed by discography. Discography would be uh, basically it was a provocative concordant pain with a normal control. So this, the Saul brothers would do this, the discogram, or it would be done, and then they would implement the IDET procedure, which did not require a surgical procedure. And then there would be an embrace. Now this is an ex was an experimental procedure, and you take a, a patient who's been out of work for six months to a year, and his marriage is on the rocks, his house, his mortgage is behind, and he's having some difficulties, he's not been employed, and you're gonna do an experimental procedure on him to facilitate him return to work and after three to four months especially after he's been out of work for over a year it doesn't work question mark here's the problem we need to have a definite procedure that works and that's where the back fusion comes in if it's properly implemented so i'd like to go on to another procedure the bak cages came in in 1996-97 and 88 and they were really sold to many of the neurosurgeons as you can put up an art, a, a, a cylinder with bone graft in it into a painful, a black disc on an MRI without qualification of that disc being a pain generator. If that black disc is on the MRI, you just put this in and the pain goes away. That's not true. I've reoperated on a number of these because it created an instability. The, fle the, the axial motion, the flexion extension center is in the backside of the disc and these are actually accentuated that and never fused. There was no stability generated. It was just supposedly a spacer to reduce pain. So that was failed, but it got a lot of neurosurgeons and other spine surgeons interested in putting metal in the spine in such a way that uh, uh, they could make money because before that, and as you remember, neurosurgeons mostly did head surgery and the reimbursements diminished quite a bit since 1992 through Medicare. The next one I'd like to talk about is the uh, uh, X-Stop. X-Stop that was firstly marketed by Medtronic and it constituted of a, of a way to percutaneously fix spinal stenosis. The thought being that with spinal stenosis, you could put a spacer between the posterior spinous processes of the two suspect vertebra and by doing so you would distract the posterior spinous processes and by virtue of that you would expand the cross-sectional area of the spinal canal sufficiently enough to reduce the compression on the nerve roots and reduce the myelopathy or nerve compression symptoms that were present. Unfortunately this is a distraction procedure with no stabilization <clears throat> and with time the uh, device put in which distracted would erode into the bone. Bone is alive, bone will retract with pressure on it as we know for years. That's how screws loosen and this will loosen too. I have a very good friend of mine who was a fellow at the University of Maryland. He redid three or four or five of these a week because they didn't work. Uh, there were several surgeons did 50 or 60 in a year's time in Miami here and uh, Nobody sees that many patients unless you're focused on trying to do a procedure to sell it or make some money on it. We go on to the next procedure, the Charité disc. The Charité disc was a lumbar disc that was sold for 
tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars eventually, uh, and I believe it was created in France, but it was never demonstrated to be, for the lumbar spine, an efficacious way of, of fixing the problem. Uh, why would you put an artificial disc in place? Assuming that the disc itself is painful, a fusion is better. If you have degenerative facets in the back and they move back and forth, they're still promoting the same problem and the motion will, will be preserved. The motion of the lumbar spine is five degrees of rotation and very minimal flexion extension. So preservation of that is much less efficacious and needed as compared to the cervical spine. The, not to uh, be negative on many procedures, the um, <clears throat> two procedures since 1990 that have come along have been basically home runs. The first one that came along was 1989-1990 was the pedicle screw. Before that we had Harrington rods and hooks and before that we didn't have anything. So a fusion, posterior lateral fusion of lumbar spine, which was done, had about a 50-50 chance of working. More than one level, two levels, increased the chances of a pseudoarthrosis, a back brace or a cast was worn for a significant period of several months at least to facilitate a fusion. And many wouldn't have a fusion, so therefore it was held back as a source, uh, to f uh, as a option to fix someone's uh, indications, whether they be neurological or mechanical. And once the pedicle screws came in, 80% or greater chances of fusion was a, mir mir a miracle. Started off with the Steffi plates, which I put those in, and then they moved up to the uh, uh, some of the, the pedicle screws, like the Puno Winter Bird uh, procedure. Uh, and Dr. Winter was out of Minneapolis, of course. Dr. Puno was at the Leatherman Institute, and Dr. Abbott Bird was in Virginia, Norfolk. And that came along, and this went to Cross Medical, and then uh, Medtronics, and then we had a plethora of instrumentations. Uh, some of the more complicated ones was the Rogozinski group out of Jacksonville, which was very complicated. But in the end, instrumentation of the pedicle facilitated fusion and uh, was probably the best home run for predictability of back fusions. The second home run I think that's happened in the industry is the beginning of kyphoplasty. I watched at the North American Spine Society a small card table in a corner in the fall of 1999 and I saw this procedure and I said that would be something to watch. And indeed it came forward and uh, kyphoplasty grew and grew and grew. I did uh, period. I did the first kyphoplasties by an individual not being trained to do so in Miami in the year 2000. I've done six or seven hundred of them since then. Uh, it's a percutaneous procedure done under local anesthesia. It's essentially injecting a grout, uh, a biologically inert cement, the same used for a hip, artificial hip or a knee, and done under local anesthesia, period. It does require three-dimensional uh, understanding of where you are in space and it's difficult for some to do it but it's done in 10 or 15 minutes under local anesthesia placing a balloon and uh, creating a space elevating and reducing the uh, fracture to the point to where it squares off and then putting the grout or cement in place and pressurizing it in a doughy like consistency I wrote an article in 2005 with Dr. John Heller and Dr. Uh, Tim Yoon out of Emory about revising a percutaneous vertebroplasty with a kyphoplasty because uh, a vertebroplasty did not provide enough support and usually with trepidation a non-surgeon was careful to inject too little of the cement. But both of these procedures were documented in a published article and uh, I still believe today that the kyphoplasty is a true home run. Unfortunately, it should be taken, done mostly by a surgeon to help the patient. The pain relief is immediate. In an elderly person where compliance of a, of, a, of, a, of a brace that is really difficult to wear is poor and 
seeing the patient frequently to make sure the brace is on appropriately does not happen in most doctor's offices, period. Most people who do surgeries do surgeries. They don't do non-operative care. So the paradigm has changed. But I feel the, the home run at this point in time is uh, these procedures as a, the best part of what the industry has to offer as implemented by good qualified spine surgeons.